wonderful, wonderful time of worshiping our Lord together. Uh, I want to welcome those joining us from Olive Drive. I uh, expect and assume you had a wonderful time worshiping uh, the Lord this morning uh, as well. Lord willing, uh, at least we're hopeful that we're going to work out a date for these guys to come back for a con- Sunday night concert in the spring that I think will be a blessing to our church. So hopefully we can uh, work that out. Uh, if you have a Bible, please open it with me to Luke chapter 7. Uh, one of the cool things is John, who is leading us here at Fruitvale, uh, John Bolin, Kelsey and I uh, went to school at CBU with uh, him and his sister Joy. And so it's really neat just to see him now uh, leading uh, current and future worship leaders at Cal Baptist. So uh, the title of the message this morning is Jesus and the Sinful Woman. Before we jump into it, I want to give just a little bit of an update on my dad. Uh, this past week, you know, these type of things are a roller coaster. And uh, it seemed like earlier in the week, maybe he, he was eating more. He certainly was doing that. And maybe he was rallying. But Friday and yesterday, it, it seems like maybe uh, transitioning to maybe a different stage. He slept most of the day uh, yesterday. I did get word from my mom, talked with her this morning that he woke up this morning and uh, was excited to watch, it, watch the service this morning. So, Dad, if you're watching uh, right now, I love you. We all love you, and we're glad that you're with us today. Now, we're in a series of messages I'm calling One-on-One with Jesus, and we're being reminded over and over again through this series that Jesus doesn't just care about the multitudes, He cares about the one. Meaning, Jesus cares for you. This morning, we're looking at Luke 7, at a lady who came to Jesus while he was at a dinner party. Now, for each of my titles, I'm sort of describing uh, what the person was before they met Jesus, not what they became after they met Jesus. This story of Jesus uh, and the sinful woman, as I've called it, but really, we'll see it's really the story of Jesus and the forgiven woman. We see the context in verse 36. It says, then one of the Pharisees asked him, that's Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, a couple of verses earlier, Jesus was called a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And now we see that Jesus even wants to befriend the self-righteous. You see, the Pharisees of Jesus' day were uh, the most influential religious sect of Judaism. They were known for keeping the minutia of the law and even adding to it and calling out everyone who didn't keep it exactly how they did. Now, we don't know why this Pharisee, who Jesus later calls by name Simon, we don't know why he invited Jesus to dinner, but he did. He was having a dinner party, and he invited Jesus to come, maybe out of curiosity, maybe out of trying to build a case of criticism against him. We don't really know. But Jesus accepts the invitation. He sits down at the table with Simon the Pharisee and others, as we'll see. Now, when you think about it, isn't it amazing how much ministry Jesus did sitting down at a meal with someone? It seems he was constantly ministering to people while enjoying a meal with them. And the truth is, one of the most effective environments for relationship building and ministry is simply to have a meal with someone. I think that's why Baptists uh, love potlucks so much, right? (laughs) Baptists, we we like to eat, maybe a little too much at times, but it's amazing how God uses the small little gesture of eating with someone to form bonds. And if we learn as Christians to be intentional and to steward those moments like Christ, they can be used for the gospel and for kingdom purposes. So Jesus is in the house and he reclines at the table Uh, with the rest of the dinner party. Now, don't think about the table that might be in your dining room where everyone sits down in a chair comfortably. That wasn't the custom back then. They would have all been seated and reclining on the ground next to a low table. And as was their custom, those who weren't even invited would often be welcome to enter into the house, to sit and stand on the edges of the room, and to enjoy the company and the conversation. Verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flax of fragrant oil, 
and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. What an incredible scene. Now, before we dive into the scene, let's make sure we understand who this lady was by first understanding who she wasn't. Unfortunately, this story has been conflated with the story of Mary, Lazarus, and Martha's sister, who later Christ in his ministry, later in Christ's ministry, six days before Passover, before he was crucified, also anointed Jesus with fragrant oil. It says, for the purpose of burial. This clearly is not that event. These are two separate events with different details. But it's confusing because the later event also took place at a guy named Simon's house. But that was Simon the leper. This is Simon the Pharisee. Simon was a very common name for Jews in the first century, much like John uh, was and Mary and others. It's, in fact, it's estimated that there were about seven different Simons in the New Testament, so it can get confusing. Mary was also a common name back then. And to confuse matters more, many have said that the woman in Luke 7 is also named Mary, Mary Magdalene. Now, the text doesn't say that, but many have claimed uh, that that's the case, perhaps because Mary Magdalene shows up in the very next chapter, so people have assumed. I don't know this lady's name because Luke doesn't tell us, but here's what we all know about her. She was a sinner. She was a sinner. Now, this word that's used here for sinner means she was devoted to sin. The word implies that she was the kind of sinner that caused others to sin as well. Her life was characterized by sin. Her life was marked by sin, and everyone in the community knew it. Many have suggested that she was a prostitute, and given the context, I think that's a, that's a, a good possibility. Now, as you read the story, it becomes clear that she had met Jesus previously, because she comes into the house worshiping him. I assume that she's already encountered Christ in in a way that she believed in him. And then she hears that Jesus was, was in Simon the Pharisee's house, and she probably thinks, well, those Pharisees don't like me very much, but I have got to go to Jesus to worship him. You see, whenever you meet Jesus by faith, you will feel compelled to worship him. It won't be forced. No one will make you do it. It will be very natural for you to do so. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he said, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This woman clearly was heavy laden. She was weighed down by all of the compounding bad decisions she had made in her life, and the guilt of her sin was surely heavy upon her. Maybe as she had thought many times about giving her sin up, taking a a, a different path in life, but then she would talk herself out of it because a different life seemed out of reach. It seemed impossible for her. You see, her sin was likely how she made her living. She had no one to take care of her. She was an outcast in society. She had no choice, or so she thought. But then one day, she met Jesus. She encountered him, and we don't know the the details of that encounter. Maybe it was a one-on-one encounter, or maybe she was in the crowd, the the throng of people who heard him preach, and she believed in him. We don't know exactly, but she comes into the house, and she comes up behind Jesus as he was reclining at the table, and obviously his feet were positioned in such a way she was able to fall to his feet weeping. And she wasn't just a little bit teary-eyed. She was broken and sobbing, and the tears rolled off of her cheek onto our Lord's feet. And she noticed that, that her tears formed a little bit of mud on his feet because no one had cleaned Christ's feet when he entered the house, as was the custom. And so she sees that her tears have formed a little bit of mud on his feet, and she begins to wipe and clean his feet with her tears. And then she lets down her hair which was against the custom in that culture for for a woman to ever do that in public, but she lets her hair down, and she starts wiping his feet with her hair. Then she takes an alabaster box of fragrant oil, perfume, if you will, and she anoints his feet, and she kisses them over and over again as she continues to weep. What a moving scene. But the Pharisee is unmoved. He says to himself in verse 39, this man, 
If he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. See, the Pharisee was disgusted by her worship. Now, it is very, very important that every Christian learn to become a very careful reader of God's Word. Did you notice the difference in which Luke described the woman in the way the Pharisee described it? In verse 37, Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. But look how the Pharisee describes her in verse 39. For she is a sinner. Do we have both of those up on the screen? She was a sinner. Verse 39, Pharisee says, for she is a sinner. Do you know the difference? The tense of a verb makes a world of difference, does it not? Here's the principle. The grace of God changes a person. Amen? Later, Jesus says to her, he says, your sins are forgiven to confirm it in her and to let the Pharisee know as well. But to me, it's very clear this woman has already received the grace of God because transformation has already begun. Now, Luke isn't saying that this woman was somehow sinless. He's saying her life used to be characterized by sin, but not anymore. He's saying her, her, her life, she used to be a notorious sinner, but not anymore. You see, when you encounter the grace of God, it will change you. It will change you from the inside out. The inside of this woman had been changed by Christ, and now she comes to Jesus in faith, in love, and repentance, outwardly expressing the change that God has already done inside of her. Uh, you may say, Pastor, how do you know she was repentant? Well, the pouring out of the fragrant oil was an act of repentance. It was no doubt a costly perfume, and it happened to be an integral part of her trade, of her sin. The perfume was important in her life of sin, but she took the perfume and she anointed Jesus with it instead. Her valuable possession was given over to Christ. No longer would it be used to entice men, but it would be used in worship of the Lord. And let me ask you, whatever sin that you have of value in your life, are you willing to give it over to the Lord? Has the grace of God changed who you are? Now, I'm not asking whether you're without sin. I know that's not the case. First John says, he who says he's without sin is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So, I know you still struggle with sin as a Christian, but I'm not, so you might have an old nature. You, you, You do still have an old nature, but have you received a new nature? Have you been changed? Jesus said that we would know them by their fruit. So, what kind of fruits growing on your life? This woman was clearly repentant, but she was also emotional, wasn't she? Here's the principle. Experiencing the forgiveness of God brings an experience. Now, that sounds redundant, and and it is, but unfortunately, that redundancy is needed by some in the church. Some Christians act like this word experience is evil. Listen, our experience is not authoritative. That's not what we ultimately derive truth from. But some people act like experience is in opposition to truth and grace, but it's not. To be born again is an experience. To be sanctified is an experience. To bruise fruit is an experience. To love and obey Jesus Christ is an experience. To be comforted by the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, is an experience. To discount God's work in someone's life because they're broken over their sin to the point of tears, and they're so thankful to be forgiven that it causes them to weep, That puts you in the camp of the Pharisees and not in the camp of Christ. Now, not every experience means that a person's actually encountered God. But every encounter of God brings an experience. And if it hasn't brought an experience in your life, there's one word for that. Dead. Your faith is dead. That's what James said. He said, faith without works is dead. Faith that that has no result Faith that produces nothing, faith that has no experience of transformation in their life, that kind of faith is dead, James says. Now, there's a problem on the other side of this as well, and we need to be careful. When people judge the work of God by tears and emotion, that's a problem because there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? A work of God will become known in time as the Spirit of God brings transformation by His Word. But to judge it as simply emotionalism is pharisaical and not biblical, it's not of Christ. No one but God himself has the faculties to make such a judgment. 
Now, I'm not saying here that everyone who gets saved and meets Christ is going to be emotional, as emotional as this woman. That's not the point. We're all different. God has wired us different. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. Some may not shed a single tear. And they also shouldn't be judged as disingenuous because they're not as emotional. My point is, our emotions aren't the point. Our faith and our love for Jesus is the point. My other point, coming straight from the text, is that some people are so broken over their sin, and they mourn it so deeply, and they're so grateful, they can't get help but get emotional about it. And if that's you, praise God, you're in good company with this woman who came to Christ. Now, Luke said that this woman, she had been changed. She was a sinner. But this Pharisee only saw her in light of her past failures and not in light of who Jesus had made her. Let's read the rest of the story, beginning in verse number 40. And Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, teacher, say it. Jesus said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus basically is saying, Simon, you don't understand the grace of God. Let me me school you here for just a moment. Let me help you understand how it works. And Jesus tells him a story about two people who owed some debt. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And he he asks, if the creditor forgives them both freely, who's going to love him more? Who's going to be more grateful for that? And Simon, in a moment of honesty, he says, I suppose the one who he forgave more. Jesus says, that's exactly right. And Jesus, he looked at the woman. At the same time, he said to Simon, he says, do you see this woman? And I just imagine Simon's thinking, duh, I see her. She's right here before us. But that's not what he's asking. He's not asking, do you physically see her? He's saying, do you really see her? Do you, do you see her value? Do you see her remorse? Simon, look at her repentance. Simon, look at her love. Simon, do you really see her for who she is? And he says, you, Simon, you didn't even treat me with common decency. You didn't give me any water for my feet as is customary. This woman has washed my feet with her tears. You didn't give me the customary kiss on my cheek when I came in, but this woman has not stopped kissing my feet. Simon, are you able to see the difference between this woman and you? Fortunately, Simon was unable. Here's the principle. Some religiously, some religious people remain unmoved by repentant sinners. They're unmoved. It's hard for me to imagine the reaction of this Pharisee. Here's a woman who's clearly, she's broken over her sin. She comes to Jesus for help and, and, and life and restoration. And she comes in repentance. And all this Pharisee can do is look down his nose, his self-righteous nose, because of her past. There's absolutely no room in his heart for grace. It's hard to imagine until I meet a modern-day Pharisee. Did you know there's such thing? as modern-day Pharisees today. Now, they're not literal Pharisees. They mask themselves sometimes in in grace and Christian doctrine, but they remain unmoved by repentant sinners. They, They see people coming to faith in Christ by the droves, turning from their sins, becoming radical Christ followers, and all they can do is judge. And did you know that sometimes they treat people worse than unbelievers treat people? 
So uh, Simon the Pharisee, he didn't give Jesus the customary water for his feet or the customary kiss on the cheek. He was this well, you know, noble, religious leader, and yet he lacked the common decency of the day. It's the same today with modern-day Pharisees. I've seen church people treat a server at a restaurant in a way that just make your stomach turn and make you sick. I've seen church people post Facebook posts before, unbelieving world that will make anyone with a heart cringe. My dad tells a, of a time when he was a youth pastor in the 70s, and a lot of teenagers were coming to faith in Christ, but these teenagers were hippies who were coming to faith in Christ. My dad one day had a bus full of them, and they were packed in the bus, and they were about to leave for a Christian camp, and just before the bus was pulling out of the parking lot, the senior pastor waved the bus down and, and called my dad out of the bus. My dad stepped down out of the bus, and the pastor said, well, you can't take these teenagers to camp. And his dad said, well, 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 why? He said, well, they're hippies. Look at their hair. They, they've got long hair. You can't take them. You're going to give our church a bad name. My dad argued with him for, for a time, and finally he said, well... Uh, I'm taking them, and you'll have my resignation when I return. Did you know there's still people like this guy today? They see a sinner who comes to Christ, and all they can do is judge. We should learn to see people the way Christ sees them. And you know what Jesus sees when he looks at a person who's come to him in faith? He sees his grace He sees his righteousness all over that person that he's forgiven. He sees his adopted child who he's going to spend eternity with. He says, that was a sinner. That person was a sinner, but not anymore. I forgave them. I have saved them by my grace. How do you see people who have awful pasts? How do you see people who have come to faith in Christ who have their past failures written on their body and lives, maybe literally. I remember as a kid, a man with 666 tattooed across his forehead got saved in our church, and we baptized him right over there in our multi-purpose room in our Sunday evening service. You see, if God can save a man like that, God can save anyone. And guess what? God can save anyone, including you. Some people like like this woman, no doubt. They bear the physical marks of their past life of sin. Oh, but when they come to faith in Christ, God forgives them. Not a little bit. He forgives all of their sin. But some people see that, and their first thought is, well, maybe they don't have proper theology. Well, probably not. But give it time. The sanctifying work of the Spirit through the teaching of God's Word will do its job in anyone who meets Christ. The Bible says, he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Guess what? God is very good at the job that he does. He does not fail. Others say, well, well, I, I don't really think they're going to change. They probably won't, they probably won't change. That, that looks like it's just an emotional experience. Listen, time will make that known by the fruit they produce or don't produce. Don't let yourself become a Pharisee. It will rob you of your joy. It will rob you of others' joy. And it just might send you to a self-righteous hell. There's no place for that. We are not saved by works in the keeping of the law. We're saved by God's grace. And that includes me, I promise you. I was a sinner like all of you, headed to hell. And God rescued me by his love and his grace. And he can rescue any one of you. There is no There is no situation in the New Testament when you read that stirred Christ's wrath like the Pharisees who looked down on sinners who came to Christ. Don't let yourself be that. Don't let yourself be unmoved by what God's doing in someone's life. I have one more point, and I'm not going to be as angry about that one, this one. (laughs) Did you know Jesus got angry at the Pharisees? He turned over the the table. There is such a thing as self-righteous anger but I don't want to end angry. (laughs) Here's the principle. Forgiveness is free, but it's not cheap. It's not cheap. Look at what Jesus said in verse number 42. And when they had nothing with which to repay, they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. You see, the person in the parable who owed 50 denarii was really in the same boat as the person who owed 500 denarii. They just didn't know it. They didn't realize it. 
Now, why were they in the same boat? Well, because the text says they had nothing with which to repay, which meant they both could be thrown into the same debtor's prison with the same consequences. Jesus is comparing our sin to debt here, as the Bible often does. Now, our sin is a disease, and it affects the soul, but it's also a debt. And because of our sin, we are completely, utterly, spiritually bankrupt. There's nothing in our account with which to repay. Not only do we have no righteousness in our name, we have a debt of sin in our name. And here's the deal about the debt of sin. The longer our debt goes unpaid, the greater the debt builds. (laughs) That's how debt works. It's like compounding interest of debt. We just keep accumulating and adding more debt of sin. But listen to what Jesus says in the parable. He says, and he freely forgave them both amazing act of grace. He didn't have to do that, but he chose to. This phrase that he freely forgave them both, it means he absorbed their debt himself. You see, if a person owes money and someone freely forgives their debt, that's a free gift to them, but it isn't cheap. It costs the one who forgives. Someone has to pay, right? Someone always has to pay. That's the law of the economic system. And it's also God's law in His judicial system as well. Someone has to absorb the cost of our sin. That's the gospel, which is Jesus is teaching in the parable. We are all, all of us, debtors of sin. We're in debt to a holy God. But if we believe in Christ and are forgiven of our debt, He absorbs our debt. He pays the price. Now, how did He do that? I'm glad you asked. He absorbed our sin and paid the price for our sin on the cross. That's the reason for the cross. That's the story of the Bible. That's the gospel. That God loved us all so very much that He sent His Son Jesus to this world to pay the debt of sin, to absorb the cost. Now, what is required of you and I for that transaction to take place? For the for Jesus on the cross to absorb our sin and for us to absorb His righteousness. What is required of us? It's one word. Faith. Look at verse 50. Then He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here's what happens if you place your faith in Jesus. He absorbs the cost of sin. He freely forgives you. And then you go in peace. Amen? That's the result of forgiveness. Yeah, the result's love and obedience and worship, but it also always includes peace, the peace of God, peace with God. Now, early on in my ministry, I did a lot of what was called pulpit supply. I would go in and preach at different churches, some whose pastor was on vacation, some churches who didn't have a pastor at the time. And Whenever I preached, Kelsey always came with me, and most of the time, they would ask if there was someone that I knew who would be able to to do a special music. Well, Kelsey was my girl in more ways than one. For many years, just before I preached, she sang a song called Alabaster Box which is a song written about this woman who came to Jesus in Luke chapter 7 with an alabaster box. I want to do something very different today. I've asked Charlene Neal to come sing that song for us. And I'm praying that God uses it to touch all of our hearts today. Now, when she's done, I'm going to come back up to wrap up the message this morning. still as she made a way to Jesus she stumbles through the tears that made her blind she felt such pain some spoke in anger heard folks whisper 
There's no place here for kind. Still on she came through the shame that flushed her face until at last she knelt before his feet. And though she spoke no words, everything she said was heard. As she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster, I've come to pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. Mm. So don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and dry them with my hair, my hair. Cause you weren't there the night he found you did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me. And you don't know the cost, not of the oil in my alabaster box. Mm -hmm. I can't forget the way life used to be. I was a prisoner to the sin that had me bound. I spent my days, poured my life without measure into a little treasure box I thought I'd found. Oh, Till the day that Jesus came to me and healed my soul with the wonder of his touch. So now I'm giving back to him all the praise he's worthy of. I've been forgiven and that's why on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box, oh, alabaster box, so don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and dry them with my hair, with my hair, so you Jesus found me. You did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me. And you don't know the cause, not of the oil. You don't know the cause, not of my praise. You of the oil in my alabaster have an invitation right now. I'd ask you to bow your heads in the attitude of prayer. I want to invite you to meet Jesus today. You don't have to get rid of your sin before you do that. You just have to decide to turn from it. And you come as you are. And he's going to meet you right where you are. 
And he's going to fix it. He's going to forgive. He's going to touch your life in a way that will transform you for eternity. I want to invite you to know him today in a way that this, this lady got to know him, in a way that brought freedom and forgiveness and life and passion. I want to invite you to be forgiven by God today. Now, you don't need a pastor to be forgiven. You just need Jesus to cry out to him between you and him to confess your sin and just say Lord I need you but we're going to have some pastors and other leaders here at the front in just a moment and we're here to help you both here and our Olive Drive campus we're here to help you get to know him so when we stand here in just a moment and sing after I pray I'm going to invite you to come wherever you're at even from the balcony here at Fruitville and say, I want to give my life to Christ, and we'll know how to help you. Or maybe you say, that's not my decision. I want to be baptized like others were today, or join the church, or God's doing something else in your life, or you just come to these steps and pour out your heart to the Lord. He will meet you there, and I guarantee you it's the best thing ever to meet Jesus. Could be that there are some listening to this message that when you're honest with your own heart, you really identify more with the Pharisee in the story. Maybe you have met Christ, but for whatever reason, the years have gone by and you've become more judgmental than gracious. I want to invite you to do business with God because here's the thing. Jesus, yes, was a friend of sinners, but he also wants to be a friend of the sinful self-righteous. <laughs> There's no one beyond the forgiveness of God. So I want to invite you to meet God just as you are. As soon as I pray, you come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for meeting us in our need, to meeting us in our sin and failure. Lord, we are prisoners to our sin until you free us. Thank you for your grace and your Spirit's work in our life. I ask, Lord, that you do a mighty work in people's hearts as you did this woman in Luke 7. And, Lord, that would be demonstrated outwardly to others so that they could rejoice. We love you and we thank you for your love. Help us love like you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.